Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, Molly, thank you for that more than generous introduction. It's very nostalgic for me because uh, it's just coming up to 30 years since I was first invited by Walter Gorman to speak here in the Gorman Hall on Gorbachev. And uh, so it is nostalgic. Now, I'm uh, more than grateful to see so many of you because all politicians, particularly former politicians, are always grateful to have an audience of more than one. <laughs> and so to see all you is really fantastic. And it reminds me of a story that uh, I was once invited to speak at a huge financial seminar in Hong Kong. But I just agreed to speak to the Federal Reserve Board of Philadelphia two days before, but it fitted in perfectly. Fly across, speak at the Philadelphia lunch, fly over the pole that night to be ready for the speech at the Hong Kong conference. But unfortunately, in the afternoon of the Philadelphia visit, there was a near tornado which damaged the roof of the international terminal. So all flights were postponed for 24 hours. So I was late and missed my speech, my keynote speech. The organizers were not happy. And they put me right at the back of the tail end of the conference at 2.30 in the afternoon on the Friday, where there are lots of temptations in Hong Kong to go shopping and things when you've got in your spare time. So uh, it came to 2 o'clock, and I thought, well, I'd better go and see if anybody's going to turn up. And this huge auditorium, I mean, 3,000 seater, was totally empty. There was nobody, <laughs> nobody at all. And then just as I was about to leave, one man appeared. And he turned out to be the moderator. <laughs> and then just as we both were about to leave, another man appeared, and he sat smack down in the front row right opposite me. So I had to go through my talk. And I must admit, he was a fabulous audience of one. He did laugh in all the right places, clapped in the right places, even cried in the right places. <laughs> And then afterwards, I went up to say goodbye to the moderator. And I thought, I must thank this gentleman. So I went up to thank him and everything. And I then made to go up the central gangway. Away, and he said, oh, whoa, wait, where are you going? I said, I'm just leaving to go shopping. He said, oh, well, please don't go. And I said, why not? And he said, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tonight, or today, rather, this afternoon, it feels like night in here. Um, I'm going to say some fairly unconventional things correcting some of what history would show to be errors, even in our favorite program like the History Channel. Uh, and I, when I see someone like Bobby Spencer here in the media, <laughs> I don't mind being quoted. The big thing is please don't misquote what I say, but quoted is fine, I believe what I'm saying. And I'll leave you with this story of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who one day decided he was going to try and bring the churches together, and he announced a sort of big official visit to the United States. And his clerics in Lambeth Palace said, oh, but your grace, you can't just go to America. You've got to get used to their media. You must go on a media course. So they did go on the media course. And he got off the aeroplane in the days when they had steps going up to the aeroplane. He got out the bottom of the gangway, and he met the press corps, and one reporter stuffed a microphone in his face. I won't try to imitate the accent here, but he said, uh, say, Bishop, what do you think of all those strip clubs on the Upper East Side of Manhattan? And so the bishop thought, ah, yes, that's policy number 42. He said, are there any strip clubs on the Upper East Side of Manhattan? Innocence. And the next day's headline of the New York Times read, English Archbishop's first question on entering New York. <laughs> so um, now we'll try and get down to the talk if I can work these marvelous gizmos. I'll get over here to get out of the way of people sitting on this side. Um, my aim of my talk really is to point out the causes of the war and the build-up, but the real causes of the war, which are so often misunderstood, to show you how the seeds of the surrender, the German eventual surrender, not defeat, but surrender of Germany, it was sown in the very first month of the war, to go through some of the military innovations that happened as a result of the First World War, to go through some of the s political consequences and social consequences, and last of all, remembrance. And I apologize in advance for a slight bias to the Grenadier Guards in this and to the 2nd Battalion, because that was my regiment that I was in that battalion commissioned uh, after I was commissioned at Sandhurst, which is like the American West Point. That was my 
the talent I was posted to, and therefore I have more photographs and more things to talk about. Um, now, in politics, there's, there's certain things to remember about politics. First of all, politics is the practice of power, pure and simple. It's about power, whether it's influence other other people, whether it's economic power, military power. Politics is about power. And power is largely based on perceptions, which some people call prestige. I mean, in India, in, before the war, there were 300 million Indians, but only 30,000 British soldiers. Heavily prestige. Um, in politics, there is usually a good reason for everything, or for events, and a real reason. And I hope to show you, in this talk, the real reason for the uh, beginning of the First World War, and the good, or popular reason, for the start of the First World War. Um, really, to talk about the First World War, you have to go to Germany and the foundation of Germany by Otto von Bismarck. Germany, up until 1871 or just before 1850s, had been a whole collection of princedoms, often some fighting each other but all in competition with each other, with the most dominant one being Prussia. Uh, and the Germans were really the sort of master race of Europe and have been for two millennia. Uh, and the Roman Caesars had the Praetorian Guard, but the close-knit inner Praetorian Guard was called the Imperial Germanic Guard. The really tight guards of the Caesars were German. And the biggest defeat that Rome ever suffered, three, loss of three whole legions, 10% of its army, in, a, in, a, in less than a week in a three-day battle north of Bielefeld in Germany, were done by Germanic tribes. Ger the Romans never really penetrated east of the Rhine except for bridgeheads. They, it was being the defenders of Europe, but they were always divided. Von Bismarck united Germany after three great battles, one to get Schleswig-Holstein firmly under control, the second Bavaria, and then the Franco-Prussian War to seize territory then. And they really were and are unified now as the master race, and therefore a potential power threat to the other powers of Europe. And these are the fundamental, this is the fundamental cause of the First World War. Whatever the reasons later were given, that the political fa failure of the great powers, the empires of Russia, of France, Britain, and everywhere, Ottoman, and everywhere, to deal with the new power of Germany that was both new and hungry for Lebensraum, for empire, living room. And so today, we might even think of China. How are the great powers going to deal with China? And even more, how is Europe and the other powers going to deal with Germany? Does Germany want the European Union as its empire? These are questions that are going to be settled, if you just think of it. Germany has one vote in the European Central Bank, and yet the European Central Bank, all these other nations supporting quantitative easing, doesn't have quantitative easing. That's an illustration of the hidden power of Germany even today. Um, this is the age of empire. All these nations from Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, even Turkey, even little Belgium, Denmark, and the Netherlands, even past empires, they all had empires, past empires of Norway and Sweden and even of Greece in ancient times. This was an age of empire other than Switzerland. And there were three great empires of great importance, Russia, France, and Britain. And so it was an amazing thing that out of these empires that were really Three, those key empires were ruled by three people, William II, Kaiser William of Germany, dressed here with a very autocratic Germanic look in military uniform, meaning the army was the big thing in, in, in uh, Germany. And then uh, Emperor Nicholas II of Russia in a hussar uniform with his, with his busby here. Um, again, army military uniform. And of course, King George V, I keep pressing the wrong button, I'm sorry. Uh, king George V, King of England, Emperor of India. Now all these and dressed significantly in naval uniform, which was the root of British power. They were all cousins, all grandsons of Queen Victoria. And you may see the great similarity in the faces of these two gentlemen, these two emperors, because their mothers were full sisters. Anyway, I... Um, 
When I, I have a, a marvelous chap who builds a suit or two for me of average quality in London, but more than building a suit, he's the most marvelous expert at camouflage. Because inside this suit, you will see shoulders that have drifted down to my midriff and uh, elements of decay, which may convince you that if I say that I was born when Pontius was still a pilot. But the <laughs> fact is that age has a certain adventure, an advantage when talking about history. And this was England, protected by its vast navy and a peaceful nation because this moat around it had never been really ravaged and even wasn't ravaged even by the Normans in 1066. Um, but for many, a millennia or more, never really been invaded and was very peaceful. And even the farms in England are open sledge buildings. You go to Houdemont Farm and those farms around Waterloo and many in France and Germany, they're all built like inner courtyard fortresses. And here, you, these are some people. This is a sort of chap like Bobby Spencer, a beer colonel, out hacking uh, in the early part of this century. And this was called military active service. I mean, it was a pretty peaceful sort of time. Here's the uh, Marcus of Worcester, the senior son of the ninth Duke of Beaufort, out hunting his hounds. Um, he signed up in the Royal Horse Guards, but was too young to be sent to the trenches until towards the end of the war, and the cavalry were pretty much kept in reserve anyway. And I ha had about almost 16 happy seasons hunting under him with the descendants of these hounds. Not that they could speak English, but anyway, they understood it. This is General Lord um, Jeffreys. You see these medals. He fought at Khartoum alongside, he was in the Grenadier Guards, Churchill was in the 17th Lancers, in the last major cavalry charge in British history. And they fought together, they shared medals. Anyway, he was there, a fantastic Victorian Edwardian. He fought in a scarlet tunic. I mean, that one has lived and spoken and dined with people that fought in scarlet tunics, to me, is, is pretty amazing today. He also fought near scarlet in the cavalry blue of the, of the 21st Lancers in that same battle. And later, when Churchill had been um, sacked from the cabinet, he didn't just stay in Parliament, which he could have done. He joined, tried to join the Grenadier Guards. But the Guards won't accept any officers that are not trained by the Guards. And so he managed to fix himself attachment. And the commanding officer happened to be uh, Mar Jeffries. Why he's called Mar is another story, but he was the commanding officer. So they came together after Omdurman, again in the 2nd Battalion Grenadier Guards in the war. And I won't say I spoke with Winston Churchill, but once my father was taking me around the House of Commons and Churchill came past with two, I'd imagine, PPSs, private parliamentary secretaries, men, of course, uh, in those days. Um, and he, he, he said, good evening to my father. My father said, good evening, Prime Minister. And I mumbled. I was a 14-year-old school boy. I sort of mumbled away. <laughs> good evening. You know. But it was quite a thrill. But um, then I came into the really big thrill in my life was his state funeral. England has only awarded two state funerals to commoners, one the great uh, Duke of Wellington and the second Winston Churchill. And here, that's me, but there are all some of the heroes of my lifetime. It was so thrilling to meet them all over us. I had them for a week in rehearsals and everything. Here's Lord Mountbatten, a nephew, uh, uncle of Prince Philip and the nephew of the Tsarina of Russia, Admiral of the fleet, Lord Alexander fought in both wars, so in here, you've got um, one admiral of the fleet, one admiral of the uh, fleet, uh, marshal of the Royal Air Force, Port Lou, fought in the fight fighters in the First World War, uh, three field marshals, and four prime ministers, including the prime minister of Australia, Menzies, Sir Robert Menzies, who, if Churchill had been killed in the war, the British were going to ask to become, to take over as the British prime minister after Ch if Churchill had been killed by the Germans. So it was quite a, probably one of the most memorable days of my life because it was like seeing history. There's Winston in that thing, and these are two members of my platoon, actually, those two. Um, it, was a, it was sort of made a bridge to history for me. So back to the Great War. While Britain was in peace and peace-loving and enjoying itself and having a wonderful time, Germany was preparing for war. And I mean really preparing in a thorough Germanic manner. Five million men and five million reservists of absolutely superb soldiers. The Germans always are, but these were really treated like the darlings of the nation. And what was more important, a tremendous gearing of the civilian machine to war production and potential for war. 
So Germany was really ready for war, including, which hadn't come into any other armies, mechanization of its infantry, very fast moving, rather like the Second World War, repeated again, Blitzkrieg, these were early versions of it, but without tanks. Superb artillery, some of the heavy artillery had, had um, uh, sorry, had uh, shells weighing a ton. I mean, huge shells and fabulous equipment. Meanwhile, the French had an army of four million, badly equipped and somewhat unmilitary. The Russians had an army of 1.5 million, three million reserves, appallingly badly equipped. Uh, and uh, rather like the British, rather not terribly keen on training, <laughs> pretty peaceful, loving. And the British army of 200,000. I mean, you can imagine why the Kaiser said that contemptible little army. I mean, it really was amazing. Well, when the Germans looked at this with this fabulous army, and the war party and German officers used to toast to Das Tag, the day when we're going to march on Europe and seize an empire from these rather idle empire owners like Russia, France, and so on. Uh, that was the military. The Kaiser didn't want to go to war. All his three cousins were all peace-loving. But he'd made darlings, and his father had made darlings of the nation, the military. And so they had huge power, marvelous, huge amounts of their budget were spent on defense. And they became so powerful, like the old landowning barons in England before Runnymede and the Charter of Magna Carta. Uh, they accumulated wealth, they were given wealth by the state, and of course it was costing the German economy a huge amount. And so there was urging, well, for God's sake, get on and use it and grab this empire. So this is the real cause of the First World War. The lust by Germany for empire and land, Lebensraum, and the ability of these not only 10 million, they were the 10 million best soldiers in the world by miles and they had the far the best equipment. So the tender wood was already piling. And here we have this empire, countries. Now Britain felt so powerful that it didn't really need any defense treaties. It had its navy, which was the size, more than the size of the next two navies combined. It had six fleets, the home fleet, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, and Pacific fleets. Not a single ship of consequence moved on the surface of the Earth's oceans without the tacit approval of the British government. It was really powerful. Had a tiny army, but a mighty navy. And didn't feel it needed to have defense treaties. So it's sort of self-insured, like some companies don't need insurance. They insure themselves, they're so rich. Um, but to be friendly with our enemy of almost a thousand years, France. The king had the Entente Cordiale and also with his cousin um, over there in Moscow. So these two treaties of friendship. Now a lot of these history channels, they get it wrong. They think these were defense treaties. They were not. They were friendship treaties. There were no defense agreements in them at all. And most people override this and suddenly think Britain was involved in the war. It wasn't. And so we have the defense treaties. The first between, oh sorry, that we have before here, this line is showing that all this country, 60% of Austria-Hungary empire was Slavic. And all this area down here is Slavic. And they look to mother Russia of Slavs. And so this racial link was here and Serbia was there. Sarajevo there with the in a minute. And Germany kicked up a treaty with Austria-Hungary. So immediately France got worried and had a defense treaty with Moscow. Britain got just a trifle worried about Germany bullying uh, Belgium, which was right on the coast. They could be happy with France protecting the great seaway of the English Channel to London. But they would maybe, if Germany walked in here, it might be a little tricky. So they did have one defense treaty, this crucial little line here, with Belgium. And so then the only other treaty, very important of course, was that, uh, I keep pressing the wrong button, I'm sorry. Turkey, the British wanted Turkey on side, but Germany outbid them. Not only the biggest bid in money, but also the German army looked so impressive of 10 million soldiers and British army of 200,000. They thought, well, Germany's bound to be on the winning side. So they joined with Aust German, Austria, and Hungary. And so we'll see how this all plays out. First of all, I just want to put in position here 
Serbia and Sarajevo. Uh, Sarajevo is in an area in these mountains a bit rebellious. Serbia was getting rebellious, wanting to get independence and full independence uh, uh, from what effectively was their rulers in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And then we had, on the 28th of June, 1914, uh, the Arch the Franz Joseph, the Emperor of uh, Austria, had reigned for about 60 years. His brother had been shot as Emperor of Mexico in the outback of Mexico. His heir, his son and heir, w had a girlfriend who wasn't royal, and so in a mutual pact they committed suicide. And so his nephew, Ferdinand, was the, heir, the new heir apparent. And he was wanting Serbia to have independence. He was actually pro-Serbian independence and very kind man. And he went to try and do a bit of liaison here with a visit to Sarajevo, uh, where a bomb was thrown in, uh, in the first carriageway, bounced off his car, the back of his car, killed two officers in the next motor car. And in the thing, they decided to go on a different route, pretty sensibly. But the driver of the leading car got it wrong and went on the original planned route. And then some chap said, go wrong way, you idiot. So they, this driver almost stalled the car. So there's a lot of political, a uh, lot of uh, artistic license here. This looks pretty imperial. Practically, he was in panic because he almost stalled the car. He was trying with grating gears to get it in reverse. So he wasn't looking anywhere as good as that. Here's Gabriel Principi, the teenager. This chap looks a little older. And he's firing at the, um, the countess who was, uh, uh, the Ferdinand's wife, and here he's already shot uh, the, the, the Archduke. The Archduke was actually wearing a blue uniform at the least. Some historians say green, but the so-called ones and the colors, how, they were, how they've colored them in all these things, now it's blue. But he was shot in the throat. Ironically, he was wearing a flak jacket, one of the very first lead flak jackets under his uniform. And so luckily, he did, this chap didn't fire into his chest, but probably fired at his head or fired at his chest and the gun kicked up. He hit him in the throat. So that actually by this stage, there'll be blood spurting out, uh, which is not shown. And this Countess here was actually a very charming woman, so history relates, and slightly submissive. But here she's looking rather like uh, those um, English country women, you know, rather dominating. Uh, uh, Sometimes wrong, but never uncertain. Uh, and no nonsense, and a sort of no sex please with British attitude. Um, and here she's standing here like that. She probably wasn't, but at least uh, she was shot straight in the stomach and f fell over him, and they were both died. Now, that wasn't the beginning of the First World War. That was the match that enabled the fire to be lit. This historians, many historians say this is the reason for the service. That's the good reason. That's the excuse. The real reason we'll see. So the lighted match was applied to the fire of dry tenderwood. What happened was that Franz Joseph was so angry with the Serbs that uh, he was furious, didn't know really what to do, he didn't want to go to war, but the Germans persuaded him to issue the Serbs with a totally humiliating and debilitating ultimatum that they would never accept and therefore provide the excuse to go to war. But under the Tsar of Russia, persuaded the Serbs, his fellow Slavs and all that sort of thing, to accept the ultimatum, totally humiliating ultimatum. So they were totally surprised, the Germans had really designed the ultimatum, that the Serbs accepted it. Nobody in their right mind would have accepted and still call themselves in a country. They did accept, but still Austria attacked them. And so immediately uh, th this attack occurred and immediately these alliances came in. First of all, Russia came to protect Serbia. And in doing so, she attacked Austria-Hungary. Immediately, Germany had this marvelous excuse not to go to a premeditated war of aggression, but to go to a, a sudden, unpremeditated war of defense, of defending your fellow man, defending Austria. So this whole pretense of the Germans to come to the aid of Austria. And therefore, the Russians had to attack the Germans. Now, the Russians had a treaty with the French. And so the French had to come in also because of this defense treaty. Notice, Britain is not involved. And so that's what happened. And Germany, therefore, had a war on two fronts. Very, very dangerous. And they thought, well, what they'll do is they'll hold the Russians at bay with the Austrians. 
Uh, and the Russians are so uh, unmilitary, great ball gowns and all their old ball uniforms and everything, but pretty old fashioned, not very military and modern. Meanwhile, we'll finish off the French as we did in 1871 in the Franco Prussian War in a calculated seven weeks. France will be finished using the Schlieffen plan. And then we'll come back and hit the Russians. But unfortunately, the Russians may not have looked very professional, but they were hugely gallant, both their officers and their men. So they started advancing heavily on the Germans and the Austrian-Hungarians, which meant that Germany had to divert troops from the attack on France to defend Germany's eastern border until they defeated the Russians in the huge victory of Tannenberg, Hindenburg, and um, Ludendorff. So that's how the war started. And this is the Schlieffen plan. This plan, this is where, this was all Luxembourg and Belgium, and this is Switzerland. And so the French Axis uh, Avenue into Germany was through here, and the Germans knew it. So they put heavy infantry, artillery, and everything down here to hold the French. Meanwhile, light cavalry, light infantry, and particularly mechanized infantry were going to sweep through and outflank the French, bypassing Paris, just bypass the neck. Don't go and look inside the brains, just cut it off. So they, 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 they went past the neck of France and were going to attack the French from the rear and the flank. It was a fantastic plan and worked beautifully in the Franco-Prussian War. But in this war, if you'll notice, it went through Belgium. And if you remember the last slide, Britain had a defense treaty with Belgium. The Germans possibly calculated that the Britain will never honor that over little Belgium. They won't go to war with 200,000 soldiers. They couldn't even enter the field hardly. They'd have enough to put up markers. Um, and, but they did. And so that is what triggered Britain and its whole empire coming into the war, and eventually the United States. So Britain dresses for war. These scarlet tunics and bearskins were replaced by this. This is guard order. In battle, obviously, there'd be khaki, khaki straps and all that sort of thing. Officer in frock coat, and here they are. But the only pieces of equipment of Britain that were anywhere near superior to the, as good as the German were the rifle, this Lee Enfield rifle, and uh, the khaki uniform that we'd learned to camouflage ourselves in the Boer War in South Africa. All the other armies, the German and the French, went in almost in Napoleonic dress into the beginning. The French had red trousers and blue coats. I mean, very like Napoleon's army uh, into the First World War. And so here are the Grand Air Guards at Chelsea Barracks just performing up, going off to, marching off to war. There's an officer, public schoolboy, um, with his ash, ash plant or, or walking stick, as they commonly call it now. Um, and uh, his pistol, no sword. This was in 1915 when swords were abandoned in 1914. They they found they weren't much use, even the walking sticks were at least useful for marching, but the swords were of no use, so they were abandoned. But this pistol, now people might say, why aren't officers armed the same as the men and more? They are today for camouflage reasons. But an officer's job is not to kill the enemy. An officer's job is to put his men in a position and let, allow them to kill the enemy effectively. The officer's in a command role, not a killing role. And the pistol is purely for self-defense. Either a Webley 4.445 or a Colt 45 is what the British Army were issued with. A stopping weapon for self-defense or humane killing. A lot of officers' pistols were used on horses that were badly maimed at the beginning of this war, in the war of movement, horribly maimed. Had a big effect on the British soldier. Uh, and a lot of them were put out of their misery with pistols. And I have absolutely no doubt that uh, even some appallingly wounded men were put to sleep in the same way, although never publicized. Um, here, these British officers were still of the old school. Uh, you know, it was all balls and bubble. Uh, and it was either ball games, like cricket, tennis, polo, and all that sort of stuff. Or it was hunt balls and bubbly champagne and parades. There was very little military tactics taught to guards officers in London at that time. And they did old-fashioned tactics, like a British square. And you can see, it looks, these bannets, these long 17-inch bannets are pretty ferocious. And a square was actually four ranks. And right up to 1900, here are the Grenadier Guards in the barracks practicing the square. 1900. 
but it was an outdated technique because although this was a, an amazing thing, and a, one of the key things is you couldn't run away from it. If you were frightened, <laughs> you couldn't get out of the square. So it kept all your men there, two kneeling and two standing ranks. Uh, and f with tremendous firepower now with the, the Enfield, but um, one machine gun placed in the right place could do enormous damage. So it was still completely outdated for the Second, First World War, but was still practiced. So Britain was far behind. This is just to show that so many names like Harvard, there was a Harvard in the Second Battalion of Grenadier Guards, and Patton was a grenadier, uh, one very thing. And so the British marched to war out of this very gate. And as a young man, I remember going to officers' mess things in this very barracks with this guard room and everything. Out marched 1,000 grenadiers and 1,000 Irish guards. Of the grenadiers, 925 were casualties by Christmas, a 92.6, 92.9% casualty rate. And inside, as they marched, next to this sentry was standing the Prince of Wales, who was a grenadier, who was in tears as he saluted the colors in each company that passed, because his father would not allow him to go with his men. So they marched out. This is one of our Christmas cards of a sergeant showing families to a Christmas party at Chelsea Barracks. And this is our new Christmas card for this year, commemorating when they did march out of the barracks. You see the Corps of Drums of the 3rd Battalion and the Scarlet Tunics and the battalion behind, led by Colonel Norrie. Out of Chelsea Barracks, there's Chelsea Barracks. The Chelsea Hospital is on the right, Lower Sloan Street, going down towards the river. So those of you who know London know that area pretty well. And here are some of these poor souls. If the average figures were taken, only two of them would have survived by Christmas. Appalling, appalling loss of life, and the best life. These were the volunteers. So we have the Schlieffen Plan. The Schlieffen Plan simplified from the original one I showed you. But again, you can see the holding pattern, and then the light patterns, and the hugely light mechanized. This was the theory. This was the plan, simplified version. And this is what happened. The Northern Army and the British were up here, French down here, um, and it started to work. But they went through Belgium, triggering the British. The Belgians held enough time for the British to come through to Mons, which is about here in Belgium, uh, and start to form the rear guard for the British Army, which was in fast retreat. And then uh, the miracle happened. The, f the German general in charge was so convinced that the British ragtag mob were beaten back uh, that he thought they were defeated. A number of commanders in history have made that same mistake, because the British are not all that Prussian efficiency and brought up in war. And so he made the mistake of thinking the British were beaten, therefore he could take the flank of the French and turned his whole division south to take the flank and ro roll up the French from the rear, right in front of the British who were here on the Marne, and a huge division that was pulled in here from in taxis of the French. This is Champagne country. Well, the French were not going to let Epinay go. And so with great dash, they shipped their divisions out in taxis from France, uh, from Paris, and they had the most incredible victory, the, the um, victory of the Marne. And it turned the Germans back. They were so shocked. And then we had the beginnings. It was the Germans retreated way east. And there was the race to the sea. The British and the Germans raced up here. To, England didn't want these ports to go. And so they raced up to about here, and the line came down through here to Switzerland. Uh, and it's part of Belgium, and the Battle of Ypres and all that were up here. And then, of course, <laughs> the beginnings of trench warfare. Now, the Germans, the one thing the Germans were not equipped for was a sustained war of attrition against these huge empires, uh, particularly with food. And so this is how it all started, and Germany got on the wrong foot. It appeared, here's the path of the Second Battalion of Grenadier Guards up to Mons, old Waterloo battles under Wellington, Namur, and Malplaquet under the, Churchill's great ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough. Very painful retreat through here, 33 days without a wash, uh, exhausted, blood-drenched, and Germans had very good, well-placed spies, uh, artillery bashed, and I brought this picture really to show you how the casualties started to affect even the greatest families in the land. The Cecil family, the family of the Marquis of Salisbury, he had two sons in that 2nd Battalion of Grenadier Guards, and the first one was mortally wounded here, and two days later his next son was killed, and body never recovered in the forests around here. So it was a very, very painful 
and expensive in blood, drenched in blood, and those horses and things, were, as I said, had a bad effect on the British soldiers um, until they got to the Marne, where they sort of reformed on this side of the river, and the Germans thought they were beaten and started to head down the south, exposing their flank, which was the miracle of the Marne and the French and British did it. So the German seeds of surrender were sown. First of all, the arrogance that you could have a two-front war. That was a major strategic error. And then the second, the invasion of Belgium was arrogant as well, because it brought in Britain and its vast Royal Navy. And of course, the Royal Navy led to the starvation of the German army and the civilians, food rights, and the eventual surrender of Germany. Not conquest, but surrender. And of course, the change Schlieffen plan by putting too few troops into the top movements of the Schlieffen plan, and secondly, by assuming Britain was beaten. And so they really uh, came to a war of attrition, four and a half years of stalemate, absolutely drenched in blood. But we must remember, you know, Germany was not defeated. It surrendered. It was starved into submission, rather like Britain might have been with the U-boat onslaught, the courage, determination, and the skill of the German U-boat fleet was such that Britain was down to less than a month's food at the worst stage of 1941, and very nearly starved into submission. There's a story that went that when Churchill came across to see President Roosevelt and asked for assistance, and Roosevelt gave him ships and grain and all that sort of thing, he said, but Winston, you know, um, we can't, I can't just give you this stuff, otherwise we'll con be considered a belligerent nation. We're neutral. So I must have something in return. And Churchill said, well, how about a, a lease on all our naval bases in the Caribbean and Bermuda? And so Roosevelt said, done. And announcing this in the House of Commons a week or two later, socialists couldn't resist attacking Winston and knew he was great on history but weak on geography. And one minister said, oh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Prime Minister where exactly the Virgin Islands are. Well, the brilliance of Winston, he got up and he said, well, I can tell the honorable gentleman, they're far, far away from the Isle of Man. <laughs> so so um, anyway, here we're into a, we're into a um, war of attrition, British trenches. This is what they look like technically. Um, but, you know, pretty soon rain and things made them in pretty good mess. Most of them were ankle deep in in water, often knee deep, and sometimes there are pictures of them waist deep. And this was one of the coldest winters on record. So that's why you've got such disease and thing. Imagine the latrines flooded when water's waist deep for a start, let alone the horror of the war, eating food, frozen stiff, and with constant shelling. These shapes of the trenches were designed to stop the blast of a shell landing in the trench, killing people in the, next, in the trenches further down, reduce the, the effect. Even at this distance from a shell here, down two legs of the thing, it caused eyes to bleed, nose to bleed, and things like that, ears to bleed. Uh, just the shock wave, the concussion of these enormous shells. This is how they were lined up, the supervision or firing line, the support line, and the reserve line. Um, with, when Barbois came in in 1915, it, with three rows in front, one behind in case the enemy broke through and tried to attack you from the back, and also to aid the people in the support line uh, firing to cover you. Uh, and even then, you know, the German wire was almost twice the thickness of the British wire. I mean, our shells might have tested and broke British wire, but they were filing it into German wire, and our soldiers were pushed forward, and the wire was still intact. Even the wire cutters that were issued would cut British wire, but wouldn't cut the French German wire. I mean, the Germans really are a tough, tough nation. Um, here's a picture, a ground uh, aerial photograph of the, uh, here's a British corporal of uh, the 2nd Battalion. You can see 2nd Battalion Air Grenadier Guards, corporal, uh, marksman, good conduct stripe, and he's already been wounded twice. Those two little flashes mean he'd been in hospital twice. Dressed like a Christmas tree, as they always were, hardly able to stand under the weight of the, the food. Here's a trench battle. Interesting, there's the Lewis gun, the light machine gun, the Lee Enfield rifle, the officer again with his pistol throwing grenades. And here's a wounded man reaching for water, the tremendous thirst that you endure when all your body fluids are going to heal the wound. Thirst is an immediate reaction of a body wound. And then a rather interesting thing, a man not firing, which he should have been doing to aid his fallen comrade. Natural instinct, but behind the back of the officer. Not allowed. 
uh, like fox hunting, you know, the pace is too good, but in battle, you, anyone wounded and you're in the motions of battle, you don't stop. Only after the a action is over or rest or thing like that, stretcher bearers, the drummer boys were, were, were that. So it was very interesting, behind the officer's back, he's aiding his friend, which you can understand and sympathize with, but not allowed, because he's not firing his weapon at anyone and they're under desperate all-round attack. Sounds ruthless, and it is. Here's an example, I show you this for two reasons. One, the length of this fearsome bayonet was a nasty thing to be facing cold steel, and the other was the construction of German trenches with concrete. I mean, far, far superior and better sighted than the British. They would sight their trenches in defensive positions, dominating ground. The British were so aggressive in the old sort of Saxon way of fighting with the ax. There's no defense with the ax, you just have to attack. You, there's no defending with an ax. Attack is the only thing with an axe. And our Viking and Norse uh, hereditary people fought with axes. And it comes out, the sighting of the British trenches must be aggressive, right up against the German lines, which normally meant the German trenches were looking down onto the British trenches. So there were enormous mistakes made, and not by any intent or anything like that, or, or, or bad will, just you know, lack of understanding of this new trench warfare. And there's a, a German dugout. This guy captured 15 of them and got the Victoria Cross. And it just shows he was the only man to reach that trench, but he didn't go back. He kept on and got the Victoria Cross. Um, here's a picture of them wounded. And the, the, the two stories of that, one is that the journey back was often much more painful than the getting wounded, rather like Jackson. Uh, in the Civil War, was his stretcher was dropped three times on the way back in the American Civil War. And the other thing is this British tin hat. I mean, tin hat is about what it was, because the next picture shows you the vastly more superior German helmet, on which the modern American has a very great similarity. But this helmet protected the ears and really made you feel protected. This little tin hat thing was hopeless. I mean, when I was first at school at 13, coming out of your prep school into this big school, you were handed a Lee-Enfield rifle and a tin hat, and they were the ones left over from the First World War. So I know from experience how awful these hats were. Uh, and the American German ones, my father bought two German ones back from the Second World War, and they were very comfortable, beautiful helmets, beautifully made. The British were made of pressed steel, which meant the steel at the top of the helmet was thinner than the stuff at the edge. The Germans were made of molded steel, so throughout the thing would stop a bullet. I mean, they were infinitely superior. Um, the casualties of war, and this is, you know, some of these are hard to get figures and there are var varieties of 17 million dead. An awful, awful figure, of which just under a million were British. Um, which today, the million in America, the present population would be the equivalent in America today of 6 million. Imagine six million dead Americans in a war, there would be a hue and cry. 20 million wounded and 8 million horses. I mention horses because, as in Waterloo, the British soldiers who wrote in their diaries were extremely affected by the badly wounded horses. Uh, my former wife was a, a lover of animals and we were out fox hunting at home one day and she had a certain difficulty with a fence was thrown off and landed, almost broke her nose and broke her right wrist and cut her cheek on a piece of flint and was standing up and luckily held onto the horse, his reins. And um, one of these English country women, you know, the no sex, please wear British road off, <laughs> very kindly handed her a handkerchief. And my wife started wiping the blood from her face and everything. The woman said, that's not for you, it's for the horse. <laughs> I mean, it's quite extraordinary. So, um, here we are, this dreadful, dreadful war. Uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine. When a shell ended in a trench, people were vaporized, and nothing was left. Metal had gone. I mean, the heat and everything, it just vapor. Not even uniform, nothing was left. But in the hazy, uh, misty days, the mist suddenly became reddened with the blood and gore of the soldiers that were killed and soldiers were there wiping this stuff out of their eyes in next door trenches. I mean, it was gruesome. And the, the casualty evacuation, as I showed several slides ago, was not like today with helicopters and numbing medicines and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it was agonizing for these people. 
and they lived in terrible conditions out there with rotting corpses, people wounded and crying out at night and all that sort of thing, they couldn't go and get them, with rats and cats eating live bodies, not just dead, because they couldn't move to protect themselves. And uh, it was a, the smell of death, the smell of blood, mud, awful. I mean, the smell of the trenches from about 500 yards behind to in front was simply amazing, and that sickly sweet uh, smell of death everywhere. It was a dreadful existence, and cowardice was punished by death. I mean, often summarily. Uh, the French police used to come when the word to go over the top or hit the bags to go over the top in advance. They'd come down and people were carrying and they were shot. So it was anybody running away was shot, just even at Waterloo. The British cavalry, after the disastrous charge, were picketed behind the British lines to lance down any, any deserters. So it was very tough. People wonder why these people endured it and everything. There was just no way out except going forward. It was awful. But of course, at home, it was painted in a slightly different uh, way for human consumption. The British deaths, uh, you know, the Somme took the government six months to bleed out. There were people, mothers and fathers, writing to their sons at, in the, at the front line when their sons had been dead five months before. Uh, it, it would have shattered morale to re release the real casualties. We lost the first day of the Somme 17,500 in the first 30 minutes and just under 60,000, 58,000 in the first day. So it was shocking. Never had casualties like that since Hannibal, and there were never again until the Hiroshima uh, bomb. And so the innovations of the First World War, a lot of them based on the lessons learned from the American Civil War, where European attaches infested the battlefields of the American Civil War, the f first beginning of trenches, not trench lines, but even little trenches, foxholes, the telegraph used for the first time in military operations, trains used to take troops, and the rifled bullet. American Civil War still fought on the tactics of Napoleonic. Battalion attacks in ranks, cavalry charges, all that stuff with a bullet that was now accurate to maybe 200 yards. In the, second, in the First World War, that rifled bullet was really accurate up to four or five hundred yards. And devastating fire, the British foot down and normally aimed fire was 15 rounds a minute. And that out of 100 men, you can see in a company, 120, 130 men in a company, how many bullets were going down. Repelling fire was 25 bullets a minute. And so here we got the static trench warfare. It wasn't just trench warfare, it was static, just on and on and on. A, a, a living hell for these people. The helmet was revived. In 1915, the British were issued with helmets. Originally, the person rather like Winston Churchill had on there, his helmet, was a French farmer's helmet. I think we had helmets at Agincourt in 1415, but they'd gone out of style. And here they came back with a pretty pathetic little tin hat. Camouflage uniform, one area where the British wear a head. They'd learned from the Boers not to fight in a scarlet tunic with white cross belts illustrating where the bull, bull point was to shoot at. <laughs> we went out to the crime, to the Boer War, and we came back camouflaged. Although that survived, Bawa for the first time in 1915 issued was a new innovation. Not just landmines, there'd been landmines throughout history, but these were massive. I mean, huge explosions that were even heard in England. I mean, a staggering amount of people killed if it went on underneath you. Whole battalions were killed in one explosion. Tracer bullets were invented. Machine guns were really improved. The British, of course, had not enough ammunition for machine guns, so they were only rationed to two per battalion. In the German army, there were two per company, uh, and they had very effective machine guns. Poison gas. Gas was used for the first time by the French, but it was tear gas. The poison gas used by the Germans uh, in 1915 in Ypres really poisoned the war because there was a sort of gentleman's agreement. People used to allow the opposite to pick up prisoners in certain sentences from no man's land after battles, and they, this all stopped. And the humor started, instead of being funny, being vicious. I mean, there was a golf club in England at Filton, which the hatred of the Germans then started. And that's what upset the king and was one of the biggest influences why King George was late in rescuing his cousin, Emperor Nicholas II, because it wasn't just respecting the Germans, it was a hatred after the first use of gas. But again, the Germans made the best gas masks. The first rubber ones were built in eyepieces. British ones were pieces of cloth. 
I mean, it was hopeless. Then the tank, which was one great English invention, um, invented based on the Roman tortoise with the shields up and everything. And uh, it was first uh, uh, tied out at Hatfield House, the Marcus of Salisbury's home, very near the Elizabeth Oak, where his ancestor came with the king, queen, the monarch's ring from the dead Mary, Queen Mary, to put on the, the finger of Princess Elizabeth, who became Queen Elizabeth I at Hatfield House and the Elizabeth Oak, which was unfortunately struck by lightning about 10 years ago. But that was where the first tanks were tried out. Wireless, instead of telegraph, started to come rudimentary. And that enabled all arms coordination, particularly between artillery and infantry, so that you wouldn't be firing into your own soldiers as they advanced or didn't advance. Um, and uh, also, of course, uh, aeroplanes were using wireless too to spot. And then the beginnings of the recognition of shell shock, that some of these people that were left carrying in the trenches and were shot summarily were actually shell shocked. But gradually, it became, mainly through the Royal Army Medical Corps, realized what shell shock was, and it was damaging. I remember when I was a, a, a Grenadier recruit, we were put in a dugout about 20 or 30 feet under the ground, concrete, and it was shelled for a minute by British artillery. And of course, we had no risk, and they had a dummies of a, of a section up on the top. But you, after even one minute, these people were going days. You began to feel this boom going through you. The shock wave was going through you. It caused no harm, except I'm a little stupid now. But it, you know, it didn't appear to be harmful, but you could feel it pressuring you down. And that was 30 feet underground. These people were feeling it up on the top of the ground. We went up afterwards and looked at this section of dummies. Nothing left. Vaporized. Nothing. A few little scraps of hessian and wood splinters. That was it gone. Uh, and so shell shock came in, and of course conscription, the industrialized killing, as I said, 60,000 lost in a single day. And then, to cheer you up, one of the greatest inventions of the First World War, bee fizz, Buck's fizz, commonly known in America as mimosa. Um, a, a, an officer in the lifeguards called Captain Buckmaster was a very generous, quite rich young man. And when he went home on leave to England, he used to bring a lorry load of champagne up to the front of the cavalry things. And he'd share them round with fellow officers and men and his troop and all that sort of thing. And rapidly, he used to run out. And so he started mixing the limeys. The Royal Navy had limes and things to keep them scurvy. But the army had orange juice to keep rid of scurvy. And so they still, he started mixing the orange juice, the army issue orange juice, with the champagne and invented this nice marvelous innovation of the whole war. <laughs> and if you go to Buck's Club, which he started after the war, you'll get the best Buck's Fizz you've ever had. And there the consequences, the political consequences, an age of empire vanished, except for the British Empire, because the king was so clever in keeping his, King George V, of keeping in touch with his people. And one of those costly ways of keeping in touch with his people was not rescuing his cousin, Nicholas II which was a source of tears for him for the rest of his life, because uh, they were favorite cousins, they were great friends. Self-determination of nations, the growth of nationalism, the extension of democracy. I mean, in Britain, women were allowed to vote, even before Americans, amazing, they're not. The rise of socialism and labor parties and, things, and the League of Nations, the first beginnings of a supranational body like the United Nations. And uh, then the social consequences, a social revolution, we had a very rich, um, middle class that grew up and was growing up and it replaced the ultra rich of the upper class because this dreadful thing came in called income tax. Uh, and uh, households, because so many few men came back from the war or were badly wounded, their servants like Downton Abbey and things like that had to, had to start mechanizing and getting mixers in and things like that. Um, uh, women in the workforce, women's suffrage starting in England and then the next year in America awful dreaded income tax, and civilians involved in uh, total war. And so it was a major change in Britain. And certain cities like Nottingham, which was a great Grenadier recruiting area, now has the reputation of having the best looking girls in England, similar to Paris after the Napoleonic Wars. So few men came back that the few, that the women that were there left they had so few chances of marrying a man because there were none. So they had to make themselves look really good um, to get the few men that were left coming back. And the same thing happened in Nottingham. So many grenadiers were killed, there were very few came back. 
and the women in Nottingham still have the reputation of being the most beautiful girls in England as a result. And it was the war to end wars. And there we have in England this poem written by Richard Binburn. And this, in every single, this deaths affected almost every single household in the country. And every city, every town, every village, even every hamlet in England has a war memorial. Someone was killed in a and every day at every school in England and everywhere and around those churches and around those warm mills, this is read out. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. That's echoed throughout England at remembrance every year. And in my youth, there was a two minute silence throughout the country. Every bus stopped, all the traffic was stopped, lights went red. It was very impressive. Today, it only happens on the Sunday and it's only one central parade. And of course, that lovely words, I thought, for the England's, in England's coastline <laughs> abroad, they sleep beyond England's foam. And so, how do we remember these people? This is, this is the poppy day in England this year. Here you have 888,246 ceramic poppies circling the Tower of London. You can only get two walls. I put two photographs together. Here is the Duchess of Cambridge, Catherine, Prince William and Prince Harry walking there. That is what a third of a million looks like in bodies. Every single poppy representing a dead, uh, not just soldier, but airman or, or naval rating or uh, naval serviceman. So, there, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've been able to explain to you the, the good reason for the First World War, the real reason for the First World War, and the enormous sacrifices that it involved, and the difficulty when we say we will remember them. Of course, none of us in this room knew anyone that was dead, killed. We may have known some survivors, as I try to illustrate, even as old as I am. I knew, met some of the survivors, but of course knew none of the dead. So it's difficult to remember them. So first, we have to learn about them. And I hope this talk has done something to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. You said at the beginning that it was surrender, not defeat. It was what? But you said in the beginning right. that it was surrender, not defeat. Why? Why was that? I know, I mean, the, the, the Germans ran out of money and they ran out of food and all that. No, they didn't run out of money. They ran out of food. At the close of the war, there were eight, Deutsch, eight Reichsmarks to the American dollar and eight dollars to the English pound. By 1926, there were 1.7 trillion Reichsmarks to the dollar. I mean, talk about currency debasement. It's happened. And the Germans didn't run out of money, they ran out of food because the Royal Navy, this vast Navy, blockaded them. Jolly like Britain very nearly had in the Second World War with the U-boats under Admiral Donitz, we very nearly starved into submission. No Allied troops marched into Germany as conquerors. We occupied certain bits of the Alsace and on the borders. But the German army was never defeated in the First World War. It was defeated in the Second World War, totally. But in the First World War, it wasn't. Uh, they surrendered as a country, and that's why Hitler and all those people came to say, we were stabbed in the back by the politicians. Our army never surrendered. The, it was one of, the, one of the reasons why they grew up after, if, for the Second World War. John, I'm going to ask people, if you have a question, um, to wait for the microphone so that everybody can hear your question. And this gentleman is next. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Could you please explain uh, the precise causes for 1917, the United States to join the Allies in the First World War. My second question is, to what extent can it be said that the Treaty of Versailles that ended on the 28th of June 1919, the First World War, led to the Second World War? Well, the first part of the question, America, of course, as I said, we had joint names. There was a Harvard in my regiment, and Patton, and all these names were obviously closely related to uh, Americans. There was a lot of tie, and America did supply a lot of goods into the First World War for Britain. J.P. Morgan had the hugest banking syndicates raising money for Britain and supplies. He was our purchasing agent in America. 
and very close relations, but America did not want to come into the European war. Uh, and the British, very luckily, they had a big uh, MI6 sort of effort and intelligence effort going around trying to persuade people in America to vote for war, going on the whole of the war. But in the Zimmerman telegram was, inter was intercepted by British intelligence, which basically said that the Germans would offer um, Mexico, they would give Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona in return for them supporting an America, a German invasion of America. Don't forget that had Germany won the First World War, which it very nearly did, I mean, in, the, in 1918, one always make the mistake of, of thinking the Germans are down, but they're not out. They're tough. I mean, in 1945, you know, the great offensive through the Ardennes of Christmas 1944, jolly nearly pushed us back into the sea if it was 60, if they got enough petrol. This time it was food. The First World War, the German offensive, when the Russians sued for peace, the Bolsheviks with the Russians, with the Germans, it left two million German soldiers on the Eastern Front. But Ludendorff had had virtually no rest throughout the war, was in such a mental state, he only moved a half a million of them over to the Western Front because he, he was frightened of Russia starting again. So, he should have moved 1.5 million and they would have won the First World War. And anyway, they punctured the British line. They got, broke through the, Britain, the Allied line. They broke through our Allied line in the spring of 1918. And they were brought down by French food and wine because these starve is true. The French are always there. They contribute to the great food. They broke through the lines, starving, starving soldiers, and they came across these villages and farmhouses stuffed full of cheese, bread, jam, everything. And they started eating it and wine and everything, and they were lying in the streets in these farms, unable to get up <laughs> to borch to themselves because the food suddenly exploded in them. They, if you go without food for a long time and eat a lot, you're really ill. And so the whole attack ground to a halt, and the Allies were allowed, came to regroup and push them back. Um, the Versailles question is a, is a complicated question. Basically, the mistake was to try and keep a country like Germany that's, that's worth its salt down by massive fines. Uh, and that led to such poverty, currency debasement, and poverty in Germany. And from poverty is when totalitarian states or governments rise. They want anybody who can solve the problem, doesn't matter if from left, right, or center, religious, unreligious, or what. Anybody who solve my economic problem and feed me, I'll vote for. Lenin, he offered peace, food, and land. Just three things. That was all. But everybody understood it, even the simplest person on a farm. At uh, World War I, the uh, conditions of the technology were changing, the invention of the automobile, communications. Uh, many new technologies were coming. What was the uh, condition of the German industry? Or did they have some influence in the uh, march towards war? inside of Germany, the corporations such as would be uh, Krupp Steel, I suppose, would have had a big hand in this, wouldn't they? Well, I don't know in great detail, but there's no doubt about it. A lot of inventions were made by the freer English, Anglo-Saxon, American, British, Anglosphere, because we were more free and more able to invent things and a very inventive uh, people. And a lot of the ideas started, but the people that made them really well were the Germans because of their thoroughness and their discipline. And so Germany had fantastic products. Look at, look at the helmet, I mean, every, the barbed wire, I mean, just mundane military stuff, their artillery. And then you come to the Second World War, the German tanks, I mean, they were far, far superior than anything the British or Americans had, far superior. And uh, that's why they could take on these huge numbers. I mean, I remember General von Luck, I, came and gave us a talk in my regiment in Germany. We were on a battlefield tour where we'd fought against him and everything. And, you know, he said that, uh, uh, this is von Rosen, sorry. Um, and he was in this big place defending the village of Cagney, which the Grenadiers had to attack. And he said, the Americans by day and the British by night bombing us. And he showed us the photographs of this. He said it was turning over 70 ton tanks. And my regiment had just come back from Russia where we would probably kill 20 to 30, destroy 20 to 30 Russian tanks before break, before lunch, go back to rearm and kill another 20 in the afternoon. I mean, they were tank victors. Everything went on that Tiger II tank. It was almost impenetrable. But he said that the shock waves of the bombs were so bad, this hardened soldier, my driver, shot himself in the tank. 
So the, the effects of concussion on the brain are so enormous. It's soul destroying. That gives you a picture of, of, of what happened in the First World War with these people constantly su subjected to it. So the Germans make good stuff, even if it's invented by someone else. <laughs> Uh, I just had one other question about the sinking of the Lusitania. Are you aware of, uh, that uh, Churchill was the Lord of the Admiralty in World War I, and I think he had a plan to bring the United States participation by having a hand in the sinking of Lusitania. Are you aware of that? Well, he wasn't. He was, in, he was first Lord of the Admiralty, not first Lord, Sea Lord. He was in charge of the Admiralty at the beginning of the First World War, and then was sacked, and then joined the Grenadier Guards in the war. Um, but, uh, you know, he had some grand, I didn't know he thought, I think Lusitania was, fire, was sunk because of Ludendorff's order of unrestricted uh, shooting by uh, submarines in the First World War. And it just happened to be the Lusitania, greatly to the disadvantage of Germany, because it brought America into the war. It was one of the big factors that brought America in, plus the Zimmerman program, and eventually that the um, progressive Wilson went to war. John thank, John, thank you for that graphic description of World War I. Thank uh, you. Your knowledge of history is extraordinary. I can't help but add a little of the American involvement in the war early on. American Hospital in Paris operated two hospitals in France, taking care of British and French wounded from, from 1914 on. They also ran an ambulance service uh, from the fronts back, back to the hospitals with 50 Ford ambulances donated by the Ford Motor Company. And of course, as you know, the American Expeditionary Forces arrived in 1917 with a million Americans to help the British and the French end the war. Yeah, well, thank you for that. It's just that my talk wasn't meant to be about the World War itself, but the causes and the things. But you're absolutely right. And America, in the end, with an army of 200,000, the same of the British, ended up with an army of almost 9 million. Uh, and there's no doubt about it. I mean, the flying, the pilots that came across and fought in the Escadrille were fantastic people. One of us, a relation maybe in this audience here, Mrs. Hitchcock, her uh, uncle or father, I think it was, was a 10 gold polo player, left school and joined the Escadrille and was a fighter pilot. So they did have tremendous contributions in Pershing and people, there's no doubt about it. When the Russians sued for peace, the only way we even held the Germans, the British and the French were hanging on by their, their uh, fingernails, would have been pushed into the sea. That's first of all why we had to get rid of Elsputin, and secondly, so important that Germany, that America joined. And it was the crucial element, because the, Rus the Germans thought, my God, if America comes in, that's really something. But still, they very nearly won in 1918. John, thanks for the riveting speech here. Can you talk about the effects of the British going off the gold standard during the war? It seems like war spending always has a lot to do with governments going off the gold standard as the U.S. went off in the 70s after the, in the aftermath of Vietnam. And of course, we know that going off the gold standards gives politicians license to do some pretty wretched things with the currency and the spending. So what are your thoughts? Well, it's slightly off the subject, but it is a good question because <laughs> We're going, all of us went, America went off the gold standard, we all went off the gold standard in, 19, in the First World War. Uh, we couldn't sustain real money anymore and spend those bills, rather like today. The question is, what are, who are we at war with now? I mean, could it be that our governments are at war with us? I mean, when you think of it, the Federal Reserve opened its doors on the 1st of January 1914. And exactly 100 years later, 101 years now coming up, the U.S. dollar is worth two cents of a 1914 dollar. 99.8 percent debasement of the U.S. dollar. And sterling has fallen from eight dollars to the pound to 1.53. So in England, there's barely a half a cent left of the money. <laughs> and we still vote for them. This will be the last question. There are tons of questions, and we have, what I love seeing here is that we've been trying to get more men and have things that appeal to men. And, but I'm going to be incredibly sexist because we have a woman who has a question, and this will be the last question. The last word. Yes, I would like to know um, how the British royalty handled the fact that half of their relatives were German and the Mountbattens had been Battenbergs, 
and that from the time of Victoria, with three grandchildren in three different nations, where did her loyalties, uh, where did her loyalties sink to or rise to, and especially since her son did not rescue the first cousin, the Tsar? Gosh, that's a big question. I mean, it has been a, it has been a thorn in the side of the British monarchy since the times of Georgian kings of Hanover and things like that. Uh, the amount of German blood in the British royal family compared to the English. That's why the marriage of the Prince of Wales to Diana Spencer, Princess of Wales, was so important, because it was going to breed out a lot of the German blood. She would have been the purest English-born queen since Elizabeth I. Uh, and so it was politically a very important marriage. It came adrift because the press and everybody didn't accept any more marriages political marriages, and therefore it came unstuck. Um, uh, but it was very important and was one of the crucial reasons. I mean, when you think of it, uh, he was a Germanic brother, and we lent, they, the British dealt with it pretty ruthlessly. Lord Mountbatten's uncle was the first sea lord in charge of the entire navy, this vast, vast navy with six fleets around the world. He'd worked himself up from the age of 15 as a midshipman to being admiral of the fleet and first sea lord. And the moment war broke out, the king told his relation, I'm afraid you have to uh, resign your commission, change your name, and yield all your Hessian uh, titles, and we'll give you a British title, Lord Milford Haven. And so he was denuded of all his German possessions, all his German titles, to change his name from Battenberg to Mount Batten, and lost his job in tears. He'd worked his way right from the bottom to the top, and the first time they were in action, he was told to leave. It was really traumatic to a career admiral. But, um, you know, the reason why King George was several. One is that the, the rise of the labor. First of all, the king wanted to rescue his cousin. Uh, and the government agreed. So they told Kerensky that we're going to send a battleship, which the Kaiser had agreed not to torpedo. This battleship was to go round the North Cape into Murmansk, free of German molestation. It was all agreed. But then the king evidently was speaking to a very senior aristocrat's wife in a reception in London, and she said, but sir, we can't have that German woman in England. They'll be rioting in the streets. The king was totally shocked. And so he called the operation off uh, because um, the, the Tsarina was known as the German woman. She wasn't. She was English granddaughter of the uh, Victoria, but she was so shy that when she went to Russia, she never really spoke very good Russian, spoke English, French, and German, but not very good Russian, and was so shy. The Russians thought she's a German spy and were anti her, and she was termed the German woman. And so he, the king then withdrew the invitation. Then the king had second thoughts and said, no, he did want to go and rescue him. By then, the government, the politicians, had said, oh, no, with the lies of the Labour Party in England, these socialists, we can't possibly rescue an emperor and risk British blood. So the government stopped it. So in the end, nothing happened. And Kerensky diverted the train he took the imperial family was going to Murmansk. He diverted it to Vivostok. With a and he made it into a trade mission to Japan with the crossed Russian and Japanese flags on the front and everything, and they were taken over. And then the Soviet in uh, um, Omsk took the train and then took the imperial family to Tobolsk, and then eventually they were brought back to Yekaterinburg where they were murdered. But it was a sorry tale, and the King George V never forgave himself for that. It was a dreadful tale, but there we are. Uh, there's one question on, I'm if there was one question I'd like to answer, if I may, on public oh. schools. The confusion in, in England where public schools are in fact the private schools. Um, and it arises from the fact that 630 years ago, 635 years ago, Bishop Wickham in England, rich people educated their children at home. And great landowners used to put over maybe a wing of their house to education and invite the sons of their friends in to be educated by these tutors they'd hired. And then Bishop Wickham realized there were a lot of middle-class British people who would have benefited enormously just themselves and the country if they were better educated. So he created a school called Winchester it's 632 years ago. It's now the oldest school in the world. There was an argument about a Yemeni school a few years ago, but the Yemeni school was not in continuous existence. 
and I think some feel by far the most elevated intellectual school, the sixth form still speaks in Latin. And um, they, he formed this school by hiring a whole lot of tutors and saying anybody can come to this school, it's open to the public so long as you can pay your share. So that's why the private schools are called public schools. Uh, they are open to the public so long as you can pay. And the top two intellectual schools are Winchester and St. Paul's, and the top two social schools are Eton and Harrow. And they grew up, and this whole thing, that officer I showed you, was a product of it, of bullying, beatings, and boxing. So aside from a sort of effete facade of gentleness, kindness, and everything else, there's a sort of inner toughness, which the Germans overlooked because the courage of the officers was very apparent in the First World War. And it was really from the public school system. Why Wellington said, uh, after the Battle of Waterloo, the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. He didn't mean it was won by the rich or aristocratic. He meant it was won by the middle class who went to public schools. The rich and aristocratic were educated at home. But he meant the new British army was meritocracy over money. And therefore, they were then there, they were commanding their men out of merit rather than the fact that they owned so many acres. And uh, that was a big trend, and it was a trend that enabled the British Empire to be administered by a group of people who'd all been to the same sort of school with the same sort of regimes. S the Germans sent their s children to military schools very early, like the Spartans. Very like Sparta was Prussia. England was more relaxed. And although, you know, I was handed a Enfield rifle and a tin hat on the first day, age 13, you know, it was all pretty relaxed stuff compared to the Germans. But still, we could shoot. Uh, John Brown will be fair game. Good. Okay. Uh, What's that? Hold on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. This was wonderful. John, as I said, John will be fair game out in our um, lounge area where he also has his book. Which, oh, yes. I must... Oh, yes, right. The book, the book. Anyway, so there you go. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>